A vicious, bloodthirsty take on a classic villain, thrilling new twists on iconic scenes, and more Vulcans than you can shake a phaser at. He is all the Easter eggs you might have missed in the first season of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. In Star Trek Enterprise, Captain Archer has portraits of past ships named Enterprise in his ready room. In Star Trek The Next Generation, Captain Picard has a model of his previous command, the USS Stargazer, proudly on display. In Star Trek Strange New Worlds, there's brief shots of at least two starships on display in the ready room of Captain Christopher Pike, predecessor to James T. Kirk. We get our first good look at them in the episode Ghost of Illyria, when Number One is forced to take command of the ship. Contemplating the crisis she and the crew find themselves in, she stares at the briefing screen and we get a shot that gives us a clear view of the images of two starships. The image on the right is a dead ringer for the NX-01 Enterprise, seen in Star Trek Enterprise, which has been confirmed by production designer Timothy Peel. Meanwhile, the one on the left shares the unmistakable silhouette of a Daedalus-class starship mentioned numerous times throughout Star Trek history. But this isn't just any Daedalus-class. Peel took to social media to reveal that this is the USS Essex, the starship at the heart of the 1991 The Next Generation episode Power Play. In that story, Picard and his crew encounter what appears to be a distress signal from the Essex, assumed lost some 200 years before. As it turns out, the ship had crashed on a backwater planet that served as a penal colony, and whose prisoners were trapped in non-corporeal form. Memento Mori is a tense thriller, a ship-based episode that sees the Enterprise encounter a dangerous new foe, but one that won't be unfamiliar to fans. Known as the Gorn, these bipedal reptiles were featured in the classic The Original Series episode Arena. We later saw them in an episode of Star Trek Enterprise, but here in the fourth episode of Strange New World Season 1, the Gorn are more like boogeymen, a nefarious, nightmarish enemy who are ruthless, violent, and seemingly unstoppable. They cannot be reasoned or bargained with. And as Lieutenant Erica Ortegas notes, No one has even seen one, so how are we supposed to take them on? This is a reference to the fact that in the aforementioned the original series episode Arena, it is suggested that Kirk's encounter was Starfleet's first contact with the alien menace. The R notes, however, that this is not quite true. The truth is, plenty of people have seen the Gorn. They just don't live long enough to talk about it. Well, we know at least one Starship captain who begs to differ. Uh, hmm? uh, 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 oh. Not again. Seen throughout the original Star Trek series in the 1960s, the Galileo was the subject of its own episode, the Galileo 7. In that story, Spock leaves a team on a shuttle that crash lands on a hostile planet. A shuttle is destroyed but replaced later in the series by an identical craft that is given the same name. In Strange New Worlds Episode 4, Spock and La'an come up with a plan to escape the clutches of the Gorn ships that are hunting them, which involves taking a shuttle that just so happens to be the Galileo. Take the Galileo. It's the first time someone has referred to the Galileo by name since the original series and the films. Though Spock also piloted a shuttlecraft with the same numerical designation as the Galileo in Episode 2, Children of the Comet. The title of Episode 5, Spock Amok, is a tip of the hat to the original series and a play on the classic 1967 episode Amok Time. In that episode, Spock's betrothed to Pring rejects him and forces him to fight Captain Kirk in a match to the death, while Spock is overcome by what was dubbed a blood fever. In one of the most famous scenes from the original series, Spock and Kirk face off in a stone arena in a fight to the death. The Strange New Worlds episode, Spock and Mark, centers on Spock and to Pring, opening with a direct recreation of the battle between Kirk and Spock. Here, Spock is having a nightmare, where he sees himself in the same rocky fighting ring, forced to battle for the love of T'Pring. But this time, he's fighting a fully human version of himself, with the showdown representing his human and Vulcan sides in a struggle for supremacy. Everyone knows that Captain Kirk wears a bright yellow and gold tunic in Star Trek The Original Series. However, he also wore a famous alternate green shirt with a wraparound flap and belt with a Starfleet insignia. Seen in notable episodes like The Trouble with Tribbles, which has become a favorite among fans for its unique design. In Spock and Mark, we get a direct nod to Kirk's green look, with Pike sporting his own alternate lime green tunic. We get a glimpse of a star chart in Spock and Mark that features many memorable locations from the Star Trek franchise. 
One prominent location is the Narendra system, where a battle between Klingons and Romulans takes place in the landmark of the Next Generation episode Yesterday's Enterprise. We also see Gamma Eridon and Beta Lankal from Redemption, along with Klingon homeworld Kronos. Rura Pente, the penal colony from Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, gets a notation, as does Bamath, the name of a Klingon starship on Deep Space Nine, and Kitama, where the Federation and Klingons will one day meet for a peace conference. Also seen is a reference to the planet Hartoria, where Worf served as a governor in an alternate future timeline in the Next Generation finale All Good Things. In Spock and Mark, we meet some Enterprise ensigns who get punished by being made to microclean the ship's transporter pads. This has been used as a punishment before in Star Trek history. In the Star Trek Voyager episode Learning Curve, Tuvok orders Officer Chell to clean the pads manually using a micro resonator, which Tuvok estimates will take more than 26 hours. At one point in Spock and Mark, we get a glimpse of a pad which contains the rules to Enterprise Bingo, a game of challenges played by lower deckers to show off for each other. One such challenge is to sneak a triple into the transporter buffer, a reference to the classic furball from the original series. These rarely seen fan favorite aliens first appeared in The Trouble with Tribbles and reappeared in a Deep Space Nine episode set during that same adventure. They later turned up again in a short trek titled The Trouble with Edward, not to mention their appearance in the Kelvin Universe flick Star Trek Into Darkness. Another item on Enterprise Bingo? Medical Tricorder Challenge – Vulcan Marsupial That's a callback to a gag from an old episode of Star Trek Voyager that aired back in 2000. The Doctor travels to the Alpha Quadrant to save the life of his creator, Dr. Louis Zimmerman. Upon the Doctor's arrival, Zinnemann does whatever he can to avoid his ministrations, including playing childish pranks on him, like this. So I spent a full hour analyzing them. And what did I discover? He's a Vulcan marsupial. He reconfigured my tricorder! <laughs> During Spock and Mark, in a conversation with Nurse Chapel, Spock reveals a little bit about his upbringing and mentions his childhood pet Salos, named Aichaya. First mentioned in the original series episode Journey to Babel, Aichaya is described as a fat teddy bear with six-inch claws and later appears on screen in Yesteryear, a Star Trek The Animated Series episode. Elements from that story made their way into canon once before in Unification. At the Next Generation episode in which Spock's father, Sarak, mentions how Spock would often run into the mountains during his childhood. We have seen Salos in live action before, though. CGI versions of the creatures appeared in a key sequence in the Enterprise episode The Forge. Those, however, are wild creatures who hunted Captain Archer and T'Pol as they explored the wastelands on Vulcan. Towards the end of Spock and Mark, we see a Vulcan playing chess in a park with other Vulcans, 3D chess to be specific. Appearing throughout the original Star Trek series, this is a favorite game of Spock's, especially when played against a ship's computer. It was during a game of 3D chess that he was able to identify errors in the computer in the episode Court Martial. A casual viewer of Spock and Mark might think the episode's body-swapping hijinks are pretty goofy and rely on some newly made-up piece of Vulcan lore to allow the plot to unfold. But long-time Trekkers know that Vulcans have had the ability to dump their souls, or Kartras, into other bodies for a long, long time. Way back at the end of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, Spock shifts his Kartra into Dr. McCoy's body. Later, in the sequel, Star Trek III The Search for Spock, Kirk takes McCoy to Vulcan, where T'Pau oversees the return of Spock's Kartra to a newly born body from the Genesis planet. During Mabenga's attempt to return their Kartras to the correct bodies, Nurse Chapel makes a very appropriate quip as she worries about the potential failure of the procedure. They were gonna nerf bitches for this, weren't they? <laughs> This is a reference to the stun move used by Spock and other Vulcans throughout Star Trek history. In Spock and Mark, Ortegas mentions a girl that Chapel once had a romantic encounter with on Argelius II, recalling the planet seen in the Star Trek the original series episode Wolf in the Fold. The Wolf in the Fold was also a shore leave episode, although it was far from the light-hearted affair of Spock and Mark. In that 1967 episode, Scotty is accused of murder while spending time on Argelius II. After investigating, Kirk and Spock discover many eerily similar killings around the galaxy. They are able to pinpoint the real killer, a non-corporeal alien entity named Redjack, who feeds off of the emotion created by his own mass murders. 
Episode 7, The Serene Squall, introduces us to a new character, a non-binary scientist named Dr. Aspen, played by Big Sky actor Jesse James Keitel. We learn that Aspen used to serve as a counselor aboard Starbase 12, a location well known to Trek fans who have been paying attention over the years. In the original Star Trek series, Starbase 12 was twice mentioned in the episodes Space Seed and Who Mourns for Adonis. Later in the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Conspiracy, it's a strange occurrence at Starbase 12 that alerts a handful of fleet captains to a conspiracy involving an alien intelligence. In Captain's Holiday, it's said that Picard's Enterprise underwent a minor refit at the Starbase as well. Meanwhile, the Season 5 episode, Power Play, tells us that Starbase 12 was around more than 200 years earlier and may in fact be one of the earliest Starbases as it was mentioned by the aliens impersonating the crew of the USS Essex, which was originally launched in 2167. Under whose command in this sector? Admiral Utan Narsu, Starbase 12. At one point in the Serene Squall, Dr. Aspen mentions a Vulcan rite of Kolinar. Surprised that a non-Vulcan would have knowledge of this practice, Spock mentions that he has yet to undergo the ritual himself, but looks forward to it someday. As longtime fans know, Spock will eventually undergo the rite of Kolinar the purging of all emotion, in between the events of the original series and the first film, Star Trek The Motion Picture. In fact, when we first see Spock in the 1979 movie, he's just about to complete the ritual when he's interrupted by a telepathic communication from Vija and is sent on the mission at the heart of the film. During the serene squall, Pike hatches a plan to spark a mutiny among the pirate crew, which is suggested he's done before alongside number one on a previous mission apparently on a world called Alpha Braga 4. Not Alpha Braga 4. <laughs> oh yeah, Alpha Braga 4. If that name rings a bell, it's because it's named for longtime Star Trek producer Brannon Braga, who worked on The Next Generation and co-created Star Trek Voyager and Enterprise. In fact, it's not even the first time that star system has been referenced. Another planet, Alpha Braga 7, was noted on a computer readout in the TNG Season 7 episode Inheritance. Considering to Pring's large role throughout Season 1 of Strange New Worlds, fans have also wondered about whether we'd also get to see the character Stan, the Vulcan who to Pring would go on to marry in the TOS episode A Muck Time. Well, in the Serene Squall, we finally get our answer with the appearance of Stan, seen for the first time since that original episode in 1967. As it turns out, he's to Pring's colleague at the Inkeshtan Katil Vulcan Criminal Rehabilitation Center, working with Vulcan criminals who have been driven from logic. Getting romantically involved with a co-worker? That's hardly logical to bring. After a time, you may find that having is not so pleasing a thing after all as wanting. The Serene Squall is loaded with Easter eggs and references to Trek past, but the biggest comes in the episode's final scene, which features the return of the other son of Ambassador Sarek, half-brother to Spock. His name is Cybok, a character Trek fans never thought they'd see again. We first learned of his existence in Star Trek V The Final Frontier, where he is the film's primary villain. In that movie, Cybok leads his followers on a mission to find nothing less than God himself, who he believes resides on a planet at the center of the galaxy. Star Trek has rarely referenced the events of The Final Frontier, and Cybok's appearance here is the first we've heard of him in more than 30 years. Fans have wondered since Discovery, which starred Cybok's adopted sister, Michael Burnham, where the rogue Vulcan might be. The Serene Squall gives us our answer. Episode 8, The Elysian Kingdom, features a fantastic Deep Space Nine Easter egg. The episode heavily features a fairy tale book that we learn is called The Kingdom of Elysian, and its author is none other than Benny Russell. Famously, Benny Russell was the name of the character played by series star Avery Brooks in the acclaimed episode Far Beyond the Stars. Set in the 1950s, Russell was a science fiction writer who was forced to confront racism in a turbulent era. At the time, it was strongly suggested that Russell was little more than a vision given to Captain Sisko by the Bajoran prophets, but there has always been some question as to whether Russell could have been a real person. Now we learn that the 20th century author may very well have been a real writer in the franchise's storied past. The episode, All Those Who Wonder, starts off with the Enterprise on a mission to deliver power cells to Deep Space Station K7. The mention of this Federation installation should ring quite a few bells for fans of Star Trek, as it was at the center of two of the most beloved episodes in the franchise. K7 first appeared in the original Star Trek episode The Trouble with Tribbles, where the furry alien menace infiltrated the Enterprise during a routine stop. The franchise returned to K7 for the equally beloved Deep Space Nine follow-up, Trials and Tribulations, 
which featured the DS9 cast going back in time to participate in the events of the original episode. During All Those Who Wonder, La'an enters Captain Pike's quarters and mentions she's been seeing the ship's resident head shrinker, Dr. Sanchez. The doctor in question is actually a very deep cut Easter egg that goes all the way back to the 1969 episode, That Which Survives. Dr. Sanchez is heavily mentioned in that third season episode. In fact, he's mentioned by none other than Dr. Mbenga, then played by actor Booker Bradshaw, in one of his two appearances on the 60s series. Mbenga mentions that it was Dr. Sanchez who was able to determine Ensign Wyatt's cause of death after an autopsy, which turned out to be a kind of cellular disruption. But based on what we know now, it was seen that Sanchez was more than a mere medical examiner aboard the Enterprise, and may have also been the ship's resident counselor and psychologist. A subtle Easter egg can be found in the noble sacrifice of Chief Engineer Hemmer, who's been infected with a clutch of rapidly maturing Gorn eggs. Knowing his time is short, Hemmer decides he has only one choice – to sacrifice himself to save the rest of his crew. He explains, My sacrifice saved the lives of those I care most about. For me, there is no other choice. Spock's reaction to Hemmer's decision? A logical conclusion. Hemmer even acknowledges him with the Vulcan salute and the age-old wisdom of live long and prosper. Though it's still many years away in the timeline, Spock too will ultimately make a similar choice in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. With the ship's systems failing, he enters the ship's warp drive chamber, which gives him a lethal dose of radiation, as he and Kirk note during his last moments. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Now, in a retroactive bit of continuity, his sacrifice in the Wrath of Khan might even be seen in a new light, as a spiritual callback to his old friend and the chief engineer's own noble deed. The season finale of Strange New Worlds, called A Quality of Mercy, is itself one giant Easter egg. It's not quite a sequel, but more of a what-if style remake of one of the most classic episodes from the original series, Balance of Terror. That particular hour of television is notable for featuring the first appearance and encounter with one of the franchise's most enduring batch of villains, the Romulans. It asks the question, what if Captain Pike, rather than Captain Kirk, had starred in that iconic episode? A Quality of Mercy kicks things off with our best look yet at the region of Federation space bordering the Romulan Empire by way of another detailed star chart. There we also get what appears to be the first clear reference to Memory Alpha, the inhabited planet that's home to the Federation's central database and library, one of the Quadrant's largest collections of knowledge. The first and last time we saw the Federation's library planet was in the episode The Lights of Zeta from the original series. That's just where things start. The rest of the episode's references to classic Trek could fill a whole library planet itself. Let's dive in. A Quality of Mercy opens with the Enterprise and the USS Cayuga having arrived at Outpost 4 for a resupply and retrofit. Pike and his staff meet with the station's commander, a character he saw in Balance of Terror. Even his uniform badge is a spot-on recreation of his original patch, though his name is changed from simply Hansen to Hansen Al Salah. This won't be the last time we see Al Salah. He'll go on to recreate the original Hansen's death at the hand of the Romulans' dangerous disruptor weapons, even delivering much of the same dialogue. It's a classic tribute. Following his initial meeting with Hansen, Pike realizes that he has the opportunity to change the future. But when he starts to try, he gets a strange new visitor, himself. This alternate, older version of Pike is wearing a Star Trek movie-era uniform, indicating he is from at least 15 to 20 years into some alternate future. The type of uniform he wears was first seen in The Wrath of Khan, and is a fan favorite. It also hasn't been seen in live action since the 1996 episode of Star Trek Voyager, which itself was a time travel episode bringing the action back to the events of Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. To prove he's truly from Pike's future, he uses a Klingon time crystal to throw the captain forward through time to show him just what will happen if he tries to alter fate. As the rest of the episode unfolds, longtime Trekkers are treated to an incredible amount of detailed references and Easter eggs from the past, almost too many to list in full. There's the opening scene featuring the captain presiding over the wedding of two crew members. There's a recreation of the classic eye lighting that was a staple of the original series. 
Ahura is shown sporting a classic open-collared tunic and green earrings, though in this darker timeline, she doesn't go full beehive with the hairdo. But we also see the original Romulan bird of prey, and we once again get the stunning revelation that Romulans are related to Vulcans, along with Spock's well-timed eyebrow raise and the original's iconic musical score. Throughout the episode, we get several key lines of dialogue from Balance of Terror, including an iconic final exchange between the Enterprise's captain and a Romulan commander. In a different reality, I could have called you friend. When we meet the episode's big guest star, Captain James T. Kirk, played by actor Paul Wesley, he's in the captain's chair of a ship called the USS Farragut. And Kirk's captaincy of the Farragut is an Easter egg, too. In the TOS episode, Obsession, we learn that Kirk had once served aboard the USS Farragut as a young lieutenant under Captain Garavik. In this new timeline, with Pike remaining aboard the Enterprise as its captain, it seems Kirk was elevated to the captain of the Farragut on Garavik's departure. Later, as Pike reviews Kirk's service record when he's returned back to his present, we see even more Kirk Easter eggs. There's references to his parents, George and Winona, both seen in the 2009 Star Trek film. We also see a commendation, the palm leaf of Axanar Peace Mission, which we learn about in the original series episode Court Martial, and then a note of his survival of the massacre of Tarsus IV, which is a crucial plot point from the episode The Conscience of the King. Like Balance of Terror, A Quality of Mercy gives us a rare glimpse inside an enemy vessel, with several extended scenes providing the Romulan point of view of the situation. Aboard the Romulan vessel, the commander scolds his sub-commander and mentions the Riemann campaign and what a waste it was. This is a rare reference to the Romulan sub-race introduced in the 10th Star Trek feature film, the poorly reviewed and mostly overlooked Star Trek Nemesis. In that film, we learn that the Romulan world of Remus was home to a race of Romulans called Remans, who were used as slave labor in their empire. Though referenced briefly in Star Trek Enterprise not long after the film's release, their mention here is the first reference to them in nearly 20 years. In the climax of the episode, Mr. Spock is in the bowels of the ship, attempting to repair the phaser array. Communicating with the ship's engineer, Spock is forced to remind him that they have less than two hours to restore phaser control. Though we don't see him respond, a recognizable Scottish accent answers him, saying, I'm an engineer, not a medical worker, Mr. Spock. Of course, this is Montgomery Scott, better known as Scotty of the original series. And his line is particularly ironic as he eventually became famous for being just that, a miracle worker. Oh, laddie. You've got a lot to learn if you want people to think of you as a miracle worker." In his final conversation with his younger self, the future Admiral Pike hammers home the importance of his place in the timeline, and more specifically, the changes he shouldn't make. If he tries to change the future, it will lead to war with the Romulans and devastating, life-altering injuries to Mr. Spock. And Spock is the key. Because if there is ever to be peace with the Romulans, Spock will play a vital role in this or any other timeline. The importance of Spock to peace with the Romulans is a reference that ties together multiple storylines across numerous Star Trek series and films. First mentioned in the two-part The Next Generation episode, Unification, Spock traveled to Romulus on a mission to help unite their two worlds. Later, in the 2009 Star Trek film, it's mentioned that in the Prime timeline, a cataclysm threatened Romulus and Spock worked with the Romulans to help avert the catastrophe. And while he would ultimately fail, his legacy was not forgotten. More recently, in an episode of Star Trek Discovery set in the 32nd century, historians record Spock's peace initiatives with the Romulans. It is noted that Spock's work had played a critical role in the eventual reunification of the Vulcan and Romulan peoples after the destruction of Romulus. Eventually, Vulcans would follow Spock's example and embrace their Romulan cousins, renaming their world Nivar. The premiere episode of Strange New Worlds opens with a dramatic scene on an alien world, not unlike our own in the early 21st century. As scientists and military leaders make a startling discovery, an advanced starship has been spotted above the planet. We later learn that the ship traveled to this world under the command of Una Chin Riley, Captain Pike's number one, but it's the name of the starship that offers up our first Easter egg. Designated the USS Archer, it's a clear reference to one of Starfleet's greatest captains and the star of the 2001 series Enterprise. Played by Scott Bakula, Archer was captain of the NX-01 before the founding of the Federation and helped shape the creation of the interplanetary organization. At the helm of Enterprise starting in 2150, Jonathan Archer made first contact with any number of alien worlds during his time in the captain's chair, many of which we saw in the four-season series. 
As such, it makes sense that a ship assigned to first contact missions would bear his name in the 23rd century. It's also not the first USS Archer we've seen, as another ship with the same name was mentioned in the 10th feature film Star Trek Nemesis, released just a year after Enterprise launched on television. Interestingly, the 23rd century version single nacelle setup bears a resemblance to the USS Kelvin, the starship seen at the opening of the 2009 Star Trek reboot directed by J.J. Abrams. Called back into service by Admiral Bob, Christopher Pike finds himself in a Starfleet uniform once again and being ferried to a space dock where the Enterprise is waiting for him. He is taken by a young Starfleet officer aboard a shuttlecraft that bears a striking resemblance to the shuttles seen on Star Trek the original series, reimagined and redesigned for the new series. The name of that shuttle provides our next easter egg. Calling station control, the officer announces her arrival aboard the shuttle Stamets. It doesn't take a die-hard Trekkie to know the shuttle is a reference to Star Trek Discovery star Anthony Rapp and his character Paul Stamets the Federation's leading astromycologist. But why would Starfleet canonize him by naming a shuttle after an active Starfleet scientist? Well, because technically Stamets is no longer active in this era. At the conclusion of Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery, the USS Discovery must travel into the far future to save billions of lives from a galactic threat. Due to the nature of the threat, the mission was classified, and Starfleet considered the vessel lost with all hands. All officers remaining with knowledge of these events must be ordered never to speak of Discovery, its spore drive, or her crew again. As far as anyone on Strange New Worlds is concerned, the entire crew is dead, including Stamets. It would seem that not long after the ship's destruction, Starfleet commemorated the officer by naming one of Enterprise's shuttles after him. This is an appropriate honor, as it fits the Enterprise's theme of naming its shuttlecraft after famous scientists with the original series featuring shuttles named for historic thinkers like Galileo and Einstein. During the Enterprise's mission to Kylie 279, a landing party is assembled consisting of Captain Pike, Acting First Officer La'an Nooney and Singh, and Science Officer Spark. In addition to feeling like a classic TOS-era away mission, they are beamed down by their transporter chief, who Pike refers to as Chief Kyle. Just don't lose my socks, Mr. Kyle. He later plays a crucial role in the success of the mission, using an ingenious and inventive technique to beam down a serum into Spock's eyes to allow him to pass through a retinal scanner on the planet's surface. Eagle-eared fans will recognize that Chief Kyle is not a new character created for this series, but one whose origins date back to the original Star Trek series. Appearing in nearly a dozen episodes, the Chief went unnamed for several stories until Spock addressed him as Kyle in Who Mourns for Adonis. He later appears in a small role in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and even pops up briefly in the 2009 big-budget reboot from J.J. Abrams. The original role was played by English actor John Winston, while the rebooted version was played by Chris Duhon, son of original Scotty actor James Duhon. Here, Chief Kyle is played by actor Andre De Kim. As Spock briefs the captain, he pulls up a star chart of the region, providing perhaps the episode's best Easter egg moments worthy of a long pause. The star chart is filled with so many references to past episodes, we could write an entire article on just this shot alone. Clearly visible are Cardassia Prime and Bajor, the two key worlds at the center of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. The chart is also littered with other familiar worlds, including Vulcan, Andoria, and Trill. The Claystron system is not far from Trill, which makes sense as it was the home planet of one of Dax's former lovers. We also see Mizar, the system that was the home of Thal, and Kor Coralai, which is where Captain Picard cured a plague, both of which are featured in the next generation. From TOS and Enterprise, we see places such as Sigma Draconis, Talos, Coradin, and Sherman's Planet. In addition, Azati Prime and Denobula from Enterprise are depicted appropriately as not far from Earth. One particularly important location is the star Wolf of 359. It's here where the Borg, under the command of Locutus, decimated the Federation fleet on its way to Earth, and where Benjamin Sisko's life was changed forever. Back aboard the Enterprise, after their mission away on Kylie 279, Pike, Spock, and Nooney and Singh speak again in a briefing room. There, they discuss how to proceed with a pre-warp culture that is attempting to use advanced technology, copied from scans of a Federation starship as a weapon. At this moment, we learn about Nooni and Singh's past and the traumatic childhood incident that shaped her into the woman she has become. You know, the Gorn captured my family's colony ship and deposited us on one of their 
planetary nurseries. As we saw earlier on a pad, the incident involved the Gorn, a species we've seen in live-action Star Trek only twice before. In the classic TOS episode, Arena, Starfleet makes first contact with the Gorn, who have attacked the Federation colony on Cestus III. The Enterprise's captain, James Kirk, finds himself in a life-or-death battle with a Gorn soldier, in one of that series' most iconic moments. Years later on Enterprise, we'd see the Gorn again, though this time it would be in the Mirror Universe, where a Gorn slave master named Sla is in charge of prisoners held aboard a futuristic starship from a parallel reality, the Defiant. The premiere of Strange New Worlds explains that the Gorn have nurseries and keep human captives as food and breeding sacks, adding a gruesome new background to the lizard-like alien race. The first episode of Strange New Worlds is appropriately centered on a first contact mission to a world we've never seen before. Kylie 279. In the best Star Trek tradition, the story revolves around the classic dilemma of whether or not to get involved in the affairs of a more primitive culture and society that has not yet achieved interstellar travel. To do so would potentially violate the Prime Directive, though discussed heavily in the episode, some fans may find it curious that Pike and his crew refer to the Directive, however, as General Order 1. That's because in the original Star Trek, that's what the Prime Directive is called up until about midway through the series when the writers reshaped the lexicon. That shift is referenced by the Starfleet Admiral that meets with Pike, Spock, and Number One at the end of the episode, who notes that the Order might need a new name. Thanks to Pike's reckless disregard of Order One, he says that Starfleet is renaming it the Prime Directive. Pike rolls his eyes and responds, Well, that'll never stick. This is both an in-universe explanation for the back-and-forth naming of Starfleet's highest order in the original series and a meta-reference to the inconsistencies throughout early Star Trek history. Early in the premiere episode of Strange New Worlds, we're teased with a surprising name drop when Captain Pike mentions a Starfleet officer named Lieutenant Kirk. It's an eye-popping moment. Could the future Enterprise captain appear in the first episode? With Pike reassembling his staff and personally selecting several new officers for the latest crew rotation, it seems he's asked for Kirk specifically, as Spock notes while they walk through the Enterprise's corridors. Near the end of the episode, First Officer Una Chin Riley tells Pike that Lieutenant Kirk has finally arrived on the Enterprise and is on his way to the bridge as requested. But when the officer walks through the doorway, we see it is not a yellow shirted James T. Kirk, but a blue shirted science officer with a surprisingly thick mustache. Pike greets the lieutenant, shaking his hand and addressing him as Samuel Kirk. However, this is more than just a clever gag to bait and switch the audience. As Samuel Kirk is a character briefly seen in an episode of Star Trek in 1967, titled Operation Annihilate. In the episode, deadly parasites attack an Earth colony on Denever, causing mass insanity and taking many lives, including that of Captain Kirk's brother, Sam. We never see the brother of James Kirk in action, but we do get a look at his body after his death, and he's played by none other than William Shatner who sports a thick Hollywood mustache. It's already been revealed that James Kirk himself is set to appear in Season 2, so it will be interesting to see if his brother Sam figures into any future stories. A series' second episode, Children of the Comet, begins with a log entry from Cadet Uhura. She is still getting used to life aboard the Enterprise and is about to attend a dinner in the captain's quarters. There, she meets the ship's new chief engineer, an Andorian named Hema. But Hema is no ordinary Andorian. The normally blue-skinned, antennaed aliens who debuted in the original series episode Journey to Babel, Hema is a subspecies of Andorian known as Ena, who live on the frozen wastelands on Andoria, as seen in the Enterprise fourth season episode appropriately titled The Ena. When Uhura spots Hema chopping vegetables, she offers to assist, knowing he is visually impaired as Ena are all blind. Spock points out that Hema's other senses compensate for his blindness, to which the Ena responds, Compensate? They are superior. It's also mentioned that the Enar have a form of precognition, and Spark helps demonstrate Hemmer's telepathic abilities. Both of these unique abilities were showcased in the Enterprise three-part story that introduced a young Enar woman named Jamel and her brother Garab, who until now were the only Enar ever seen on Star Trek. In that story, the Romulans kidnapped Garab and used his abilities to pilot a deadly new drone ship in an attempt to provoke a war between galactic powers. During his dinner with the crew, Captain Pike entertains with a story from his earlier years. He was chasing down a pantless Norsekin while working a security job and fell flat on his face after tripping over the alien's pants, phaser still in hand. It's an incident that would apparently play at least some role in his switch to command. 
But it wasn't the last time a future Enterprise captain would tangle with some nasty Norsekins. While we haven't seen Norsekins that often, this brutish alien race made a memorable first impression in the Next Generation episode, Tapestry. In that story, Picard dies and meets Q in the afterlife. He offers him a chance to go back in time and change his past. In doing so, Picard revisits a violent incident from his early days in Starfleet. While awaiting his first orders after graduating from Starfleet Academy, Picard and two friends have a run-in with some Narsikans, who attempt to cheat them in a game of Domjot. Defending his friend from a vicious melee, Picard is impaled through the back by one of the aliens, requiring him to have an artificial heart implanted that he'd carry for the rest of his natural life. Thankfully, it doesn't sound like Pike's brush with Narsikins was quite so harrowing. The second episode of Strange New Worlds takes the Enterprise to the Persephone star system. A planet there is endangered by a massive comet that is due to strike its surface in a world-ending event. In his briefing, Spock says that the people on the planet are a primitive race with no way to know the threat they face and no way to stop it. With the people below unable to save themselves, Pike and the crew get to work on finding a way to divert the comet from Persephone 3. But this won't be the last time an Enterprise crew makes a visit to Persephone. It originally popped up in a first season episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, set nearly a century later. Though it wasn't Persephone 3, the Enterprise D visited the Persephone system briefly in the episode Too Short a Season. In that story, Picard and his Enterprise crew travel to Persephone 5 to pick up a renowned Federation negotiator, elderly Admiral Mark Jameson. From there, they warp to Mordan 4 to oversee the release of prisoners taken in a terrorist hostage situation. Things don't go as planned, of course. It's revealed that Jameson himself may be responsible for the crisis, the fallout from another incident he was involved in decades before. Nurse Christine Chapel and Mr. Spock had a brief interaction in the premiere episode and their encounter in Children of the Comet made it clear there's some serious tension there, at least from Chapel's side of things. As Spock, La'an, Ahura, and Lieutenant Sam Kirk prepare to beam to the surface of the comet, Chapel inoculates them with an anti-radiation drug. When she administers a dose to Spock, she openly flirts with the Vulcan science officer, though Spock doesn't seem to notice. Ahura does, however, and mocks him later in the episode, sarcastically referring to Chapel as his girlfriend. I am a Vulcan. We are too honest by nature. Your girlfriend must love that, huh? The Sparks are, of course, a direct reference to the original series, in which Nurse Chapel, played then by series creator Gene Roddenberry's wife, Major Barrett, showed an open attraction to Spark and even got jealous of his relationship with T'Pring. It was in the episode The Naked Time that Chapel professed her love for him, and in Plato's Stepchildren, they even shared a kiss. Though in the episode, it was while they were coerced by alien telepaths, and neither was entirely comfortable with the encounter. Under the influence of a love potion, Spock himself became infatuated with Chapel in the quasi-canonical Star Trek the Animated Series episode Mud's Passion. Where Strange New Worlds will take their relationship remains to be seen. Inside the alien structure on the comet's surface, the landing party discovers a mysterious alien egg. Unable to get many readings, it's up to Uhura to decipher the inscriptions on the egg's surface and find a way to lower the comet's artificial shielding. If she can't, the comet will destroy Persephone 3. Uhura unwittingly discovers how to communicate with the egg when she begins humming an old Kenyan folk melody to alleviate her anxiety. As it turns out, the comet's intelligence communicates through musical tones. Diehard Trekkies will recall that in the original series, Uhura had shown an aptitude for singing, and was seen doing so on more than one occasion. She was most fond of a song called Beyond Antares, which she sang in two different episodes, The Conscience of the King and The Changeling. Later in Children of the Comet, Uhura and Spock sing together to communicate with the intelligence. And as Star Trek fans know, this wouldn't be the last time they performed side by side. In the 1966 episode Charlie X, Spock plays a Vulcan loose, while Uhura accompanies him with her sweet voice, performing a song titled O oh on the Starship Enterprise. As the landing party works inside the comet to alter its course, Pike and the Enterprise find themselves confronted by an alien ship. The beings aboard it refer to themselves as the Shepherds. They warn Pike not to interfere with the comet, which they believe is a kind of divine life-bringer. This is a powerful starship that the Enterprise can't compete with, so they're careful not to anger them. But they cannot abandon the mission to save the planet either. When they're finally forced into a firefight, Pike issues a command to get them out of there, barking, Escape pattern April Omega-3. This is a clear reference to Robert April, the former Enterprise captain who we met in the Strange New Worlds premiere. 
April became official canon in an episode of Star Trek Discovery, where his name appeared on a computer screen as part of a list of Starfleet's most decorated captains, alongside Pike, Jonathan Archer, Matthew Decker from the original series episode The Doomsday Machine, and Philippa Giorgio. Given that April has an escape maneuver named after him, it's no wonder he's considered one of the best. In the third episode, Ghosts of Illyria, the Enterprise visits an Illyrian colony on an alien world. According to Number One's log entry, which opens the episode, the colony has been abandoned with no explanation, and they are there to discover why. She also describes Illyrians as a race of people who use genetic modifications to enhance their capabilities and levels of function. But the Illyrians are not a new species to Star Trek, having appeared once before in a third season episode of Enterprise titled Damage. That episode took place in the midst of the season's Zindi War arc, and saw Captain Archer encounter an Illyrian vessel while his ship was badly damaged. The Illyrians were also in distress, so Archer offered to help, but he wanted a warp coil in return. The Enterprise's warp drive had been rendered non-functional, and without a new one they would be unable to stop the Zindi from completing their mission to wipe out Earth. Denied by the Illyrians, who can't afford to go without a warp drive either, the story sees Archer grapple with the moral decision of whether or not to steal it in order to save billions of lives. In Ghosts of Illyria, the one Illyrian we do see is identical to a human, while the Illyrians in Damage had a series of unusual cranial ridges. Of course, given their practice of genetic modifications, it's anyone's guess what Illyrians look like naturally. In Episode 3, a landing party is sent to the Illyrian colony to investigate. We see Pike, Una, Spock, and a handful of Enterprise officers looking for anything that might point to why the colony was abandoned. Our first clue is a massive electrical storm on the horizon. The away team is dressed for the occasion, sporting dark grey duty jackets over their more colorful classic uniforms. It's a cool look, but it's also an easter egg. We saw something similar in Star Trek the original series. The grey landing party jackets appear to be a nod to the overcoats worn by the away team in The Cage, the original pilot episode. In The Cage, Pike, Spock, and the rest of the landing party sport similar coats during their away mission to a planet in the Talos system, which has been broadcasting a distress signal. The rejected pilot episode wasn't seen in full until it was released on VHS, as part of the 20th anniversary celebrations in 1986. Though footage from it did appear in the original series episode The Menagerie, which flashed back to the events of Talos IV. The jackets seen in Ghost of Illyria are a clear callback, with the design updated for the new series, offering crew members better protection in hostile environments. Chief of Security La'ana Nooney in Singh shares a well-known last name with one of the biggest baddies in Star Trek history, Khan Nooney and Singh, best known as the nemesis of Captain Kirk in the film Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. This famous villain first appeared in the original series episode Space Seed, where it's revealed that he was one of the genetically engineered tyrants who plunged Earth into chaos during the eugenics war of the 1990s. Put in suspended animation, he was brought back in the 23rd century, where he battled Kirk in the aforementioned episode and again in the second Star Trek film, following his first defeat. In Ghost of Illyria, it's revealed that La'an is indeed a descendant of Khan, though it's heavily implied that she has none of the genetic superiority of her ancestor. She seems to harbor at least some resentment over her heritage. Having been bullied in her youth by those who learned that she was related to one of Earth's worst historical madmen, it seems that Augment was a common playground insult used against her, a nod to Khan. A key plot point in Ghosts of Illyria is the Federation's ban on genetic modifications. It's mentioned that after the eugenics wars, Earth and later Starfleet and the Federation placed a ban on genetic engineering and so-called augments. It's also confirmed that those who are genetically engineered or modified in any way cannot serve in Starfleet. Once again, this directly references the original series episode Space Seed, but it also recalls several Star Trek Deep Space Nine episodes involving Julian Bashir, the show's resident chief medical officer. In the episode Dr. Bashir, I presume, it's revealed that Bashir was in fact genetically modified as a child. Born with mental and physical challenges, his parents arranged for genetic tampering, turning him into a genius and elite athlete. He's forced to hide his true nature to maintain his career in Starfleet. But the truth is, I'm a fraud. You're not a fraud. I don't care how many enhancements your parents had done. When he's discovered, he's threatened with expulsion until his father surrenders himself to authorities and strikes a bargain to allow Bashir to stay in service. 
This parallels the story of number one. It's funny how genetic modification still puts everyone on edge. In Ghosts of Illyria, she acknowledges that she, like Bashir, is in fact genetically modified. Once again, a prominent Star Trek cast member must face the consequences of their genetic status. But she doesn't need to worry. A deadly virus is sweeping through the ship in Ghosts of Illyria, which is why Number One feels compelled to reveal her genetic origins. The Illyrium believes her genetically modified blood could provide a cure. But Dr. Umbenga explains that he's not allowed to use Illyrium blood for medical purposes. When the doctor catches the virus and prepares himself for sedation, he has a heart-to-heart -heart with Number One regarding the blood ban and how intolerance throughout history has held back medical science. In classic Star Trek fashion, they talk of prejudice and bigotry, of how fear of those who are different has never gone away. Even after humans have put aside their differences on Earth, they simply found new neighbors on different planets to hate. He cites the reaction towards the mixing of human and Vulcan blood, a direct reference to the events of Star Trek Enterprise. In a two-part story spread across the episodes Demons and Terra Prime, we met a group of humans on Earth around a century before Strange New Worlds who feared the mixing of human and Vulcan DNA. They were willing to kill to prevent the two races from intermingling. Yes, promote the total degradation of mankind by encouraging alien human relations. While humanity has gotten past that hatred by the time of Strange New Worlds, their shunning of Illyrians proves they still have a long way to go. During the climax of Ghosts of Illyria, Una admits that she is Illyrian and is genetically modified like most of her kind. As we know, she kept this secret because of the Federation's ban on genetic modifications. What fans and viewers might not know, however, is that this was already established in the Star Trek expanded universe of novels. It's mentioned in the book Vulcan's Glory, published in 1989. In that book, written by original series writer DC Fontana, we learn that Number One's name is Una. But it's said that this is not a real Illyrian name. In the book, her heritage is no secret, and her real name is not pronounceable by humans. Instead, she took the name Una, meaning One. Her moniker, Number One, was not meant to signify her rank as the first officer, but rather highlight the fact that she was the best of her kind. Of course, this hasn't been made official, but if Strange New Worlds has pulled her Illyrian ancestry into play, anything is possible. After the crisis aboard the ship has been solved in Ghosts of Illyria, Number One arrives in the sick bay to confront Dr. Mbenga about the cause. It seems that the emergency transporters in the ship's sick bay weren't updated in space dock at Umbenga's insistence. This resulted in a malfunction that allowed an infectious disease to get past the system's biofilters, which normally screen out foreign toxins, viruses, and dangerous bacteria. Number one realizes why when she analyzes Hemmer's diagnostic report of the sickbay transporters. Dr. Umbenga is keeping someone or something alive in the transporter buffer. This is when we learn Umbenga's secret. His daughter was diagnosed with a devastating terminal illness and he soon realized that the only way to save her was to keep her pattern circulating within the transporter buffer. Did you know there's no limit on how long you can store someone's pattern in the buffer? Well, Trekkies do know because they've seen it before. In the Next Generation episode, Relics, the Enterprise-D crew meets the original Enterprise's chief engineer, Scotty, who did the same thing to stay alive for more than 70 years. We know Scotty and Mbenga will eventually serve together in the years that follow this episode. Perhaps Scotty learned the trick from the savvy physician. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.